session and I'd like to welcome the following officials from Comreg to the meeting to discuss the National Broadband Plan. Mr Garrett Blaney, Chair Chairperson and Commissioner, Mr Jeremy Godfrey, Commissioner, Mr Robert Murick, Commissioner and Ms Barbara Delaney, Director of Retail and Consumer Services. Before we begin, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the Chairman to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons, entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her or it identifiable. I also wish to advise you that any submission or opening statements that you've made to the committee will be published on the committee website after this meeting. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they shouldn't comment, criticise or make charges against a person outside the houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I just remind members and witnesses to turn off your mobile phones as they interfere with the sound system. Um, I'll now ask Mr Blaney to give your opening statement. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Carlach, and on behalf of the Commission for Communications Regulation, we are happy to appear before the committee again to address further queries on the National Broadband Plan and specifically in relation to universal service. I am joined today by my fellow commissioners, Jeremy Godfrey and Robert Murick, and also by my colleague Barbara Delaney, who is the Director of Retail and Consumer Services in Comreg. As I stated when we appeared on the 5th of June, I have been uh, Chair of Comreg since January of this year. My fellow Commissioner Robert uh, also joined at this time, while Jeremy has now been with Comreg for almost six years. Comreg, as you know, is the National Regulatory Authority for electroni Electronic Communications. We promote competition and investment in the sector. We uphold end user rights and we manage the radio spectrum. In our recent published strategy, statement, we confirmed our vision for the sector that consumers and businesses in Ireland have affordable, high quality and widespread access to communication services and applications that support their social and economic needs. Our role in achieving this vision is to ensure that the communications market operate effectively in the interests of end users and society. Over the past several years, predictable and proportional regulation has created an environment which has led to investment in high-speed broadband networks covering three quarters of the premises in the state. At the same time, there has been an increasing choice of service providers, and over the next few years, operators plan to make available direct fibre connections to most of these premises. However, there are parts of the state where the population density is lower, and high-speed broadband would not be a viable commercial investment. Consumers and businesses in these areas have not benefited equally. This is why we welcome the Government's National Broadband Plan, which will address this market failure. Comreg has provided the Committee with a detailed submission on universal service um, in advance of this meeting, but in the interest of time, I will just give a, a summary, if that is okay. Universal service is a safety net. It is currently used to ensure that voice and other basic communication services are made available at an affordable price to a minority of citizens that may not be able to access those services as they are not commercially available when the majority of citizens already have that access. It also protects citizens where legacy services are in danger of being withdrawn or not provided an acceptable quality standard when there is no affordable alternative. With regard, to broad, with regard to broadband, the current legislative framework does not allow for a universal service obligation that includes high-speed broadband. Previous government policy interventions have been used to bring basic broadband to end users. The NBP is designed to ensure high-speed broadband. The current obligations under the universal service, i.e. not broadband, were put in place by Comreg to provide a safety net to ensure that end users can access voice and other basic services. A new framework has been adopted in EU law, but this has not yet been transposed, but which is due to be transposed into national law by the end of 2020. This makes provision for member states to use a USO, a universal service obligation, to ensure that adequate broadband is available to all end users. 
It is for member states to define adequate broadband in light of various criteria and in light of national conditions. The mechanism, the USO, is not intended to replace public policy interventions such as the NBP or commercial rollout. Instead, the new framework permits a USO only to be used to ensure the connection of remaining unserviced premises where the commercial rollout and public policy interventions cannot achieve this. It does not, in our view, allow a USO to replace a public policy intervention such as NBP, which must be carried out in advance of the consideration of any USO being required to put in place as necessary. If a USO were implemented, there would need to be an open process to select a universal service providers, provider or providers so that all interested parties could be considered and market distortion is minimised. While transposition of this legislation is required by the 21st of December 2020, subsequent analysis regarding the necessity of a broadband USO and any subsequent consideration of designation of a universal service provider, if appropriate, would require additional time. Under the new framework, where the verified net costs is found to be an unfair burden, designated providers could be compensated for the verified net costs of providing the USO. The financing of the verified net costs could come from public funds or industry or both, depending on how it is transposed by DCCIE by the department. Comreg's role under the new framework has yet to be determined. Fine Gael headquarters, what questions Sorry. they ask, but maybe wait till yeah. it's yeah. over before you do Mr. that. Mr Blaney give his opening statement. This will be made clear upon transposition. While there are some responsibilities set out for national regulatory authorities NRAs, the majority of requirements contained within the new framework are firmly placed on member states. Comreg anticipates that it may be assigned further responsibilities by the Department of DCCE to carry out on behalf of the member state, i.e. Ireland. How, however, the detail of such responsibilities will not be certain until transposition has been completed. Some of the issues that may be raised by the committee are, are currently the subject of court proceedings, and in circumstances it would not be appropriate for, for Comrade to comment on these issues, and I hope you'll, you'll bear with us on that. We just, we just wanted to note that at the start. And I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to appear today and make this statement, and we're happy to take any questions uh, on this statement or anything else. And I'll start Deputy Timmy okay. Dooley. Thanks very much, Chair, and uh, just to, to thank Mr Blaney for that uh, presentation. So, so, so what you're saying is that the legislative framework is not, is not available here at the moment um, to proceed with the USO for the provision of broadband. Um, and that's as a result of the non-transposition of the EU legislation. So obviously that's something that the Department are actively involved in at the moment. Yeah, I mean, obviously it has to be done by, by the end of 2020, so the, the Department have started that process, but there's obviously a lot more work to be done, and we'll be happy to assist them in any way. If that's and from your, from your sort of uh, knowledge of what's happening in other European countries in terms of the way they have transposed, is there, is there any of the Member States that have already transposed this directive? No, none of them have transposed it, but there is USO provision in, in a number of countries. I think it's important, though, to to reflect the fact that the USO is only for the small number of people who are not getting the services that are there for everyone else. So I'll give you an example. The UK, so there's some discussion I know at previous committees about the UK. So in the UK, 98% of the people have 10 megabits per second. So there's only 2% who don't. So in the UK now, the USO is to make sure that the 2% who don't will get that. So. It's, it's where the majority of people have a service, and the USO is to make sure that the minority who don't then benefit from but that is service. But that, is that up for definition by the member state? So, so if Ireland hadn't, it, it, let's just say there was no NBP envisaged by the state, so there was no policy intervention on the horizon right now. Uh, and based on the transposition of the EU directive, we then had a, effectively a toolkit within the, that legislation, USO being one. Could you define the USO then to provide broadband to those that don't currently have it? In other words, the 542,000. 
So if you read the directive, and it sort of, you know, our reading of the directive is that the first thing you have to do is use commercial um, arrangements first. Yeah. Clearly that hasn't worked yeah, in so the market, scenario. Accepted market failure. Then, yeah, sorry. then it says you must investigate policy interventions. So it's very clear that there's sort of a hierarchy. First it's commercial, then it's policy interventions, and only then after the policy interventions have been done can a USO be used. So that's what's set out, and any transposition will have to reflect what's in the directive. That, that's but if, yeah, the so what I'm trying to get to is, if the policy intervention was less, was less expensive and hadn't sought to cover the 542,000, if it had, was going to cover 100,000, could you then use the USO to do the remaining number? It seems to me to be somewhat arbitrary, because there isn't a definition as to what the public policy intervention necessarily is. So therefore, the, the, only, the only overriding principles that seem to underpin a USO is you just got to do the rest of them, whatever the rest might be, after you having looked at the commercial reality, which we know. Um, you then have the public policy intervention, which there's no set criteria as to what that has to be, or is there? No, so I think the difficulty is if you move away from the principle of the USO, which is giving to a minority what the majority have, then you're sort of, you're, you're not really, it's not a USO anymore, and no, it's more like a policy intervention. Okay. And if you look at the current situation, so there's yeah. whatever it is, a million and a half premises in the state, a million have broadband, high-speed broadband, a half a million don't. There's a majority and a minority there. You seem to suggest to me that it's only in a very small, a much smaller category that you could apply the USO. Yeah, I, I, but that's I mean, not defined. It's th this will be a matter for transposition. But it, in terms of the experience that we've seen elsewhere, and I gave, I'll go back to the UK example. So, 98% of the people have the, the 10 megabits they've set as the level, and then 2% don't. And the USO there is to make sure that the 2% get what the 98%. Have I think in the case then of the two percent became twenty yeah. percent, I think people would say, well, that doesn't start to sound like a USO anymore. That starts to sound like a, a policy intervention. But look, we're only giving you our interpretation of what we've read in the legislation. This hasn't been transposed, so ultimately decisions about exactly where the threshold is between policy and USO will be a matter for the transposition process. And, and just for clarity, time. the yeah. transposition is a matter for the Irish government. It is right. So, so, so. so that's a devolved responsibility. Um, so, in theory, the government could set that, or the department could set that scale. I think the transposition has to reflect though, what's in the primary directive, the European directive. Oh, oh, so clearly, like, yeah. clearly the, the, the government would be challenged if it, if it veers outside that. So, you know, that's a matter for the government as they go through it. But we're just giving you our experience of what we've seen elsewhere and the transposition elsewhere on. The implementation of USO more broadly is very much the small number of customers that are left when the majority have it. Um, and we've seen that not just in the UK but many other countries. Many countries have had a policy interventions not dissimilar to the NBP and then after that then they will apply some sort of USO to make sure that it's a safety net, okay. that the safety net is there to capture anyone who hasn't been captured by that. Okay, so we just, yeah, that, I think that there's some, some, some clarity there. Just to move, move on then to the, uh, just, just to move on to the discussion that we had with AIR, and you'll be familiar, I'm sure, through media reports of the, the comments of AIR, and you may indeed have been familiar with um, the position taken by the former chief executive, Mr. Moat, in his communications, where he indicated that the process had become overly cumbersome and complex um, and burdensome, in a sense, that required, in the case of AIR, uh, based on what, what they told us, to set up separate structures and oversight, etc., which was adding greatly to the cost of the provision of the service. Um, AIR indicated to us that if you stripped away a lot of that regulatory piece um, that was required of them to create a level playing pitch for all to compete, that they could deliver broadband at less than a billion, where we understand the state are looking at spending upwards of three billion with the preferred bidder. Obviously, there's an encumbrance on us to try and get to the bottom of that. It seems like we've got to interrogate that to the greatest extent possible, um, and we've got to try and, and get high-speed broadband to the people who want it as quickly as possible, but we've got to do it in a judicious way and in a cost-effective way. Would you have any comments around what AIR have said in relation to uh, the, the um, procurement process and the 
overly burdensome requirements that they believe are adding to the cost? From a, from a regulatory point of view, could you, could you share with us your thoughts on that? So, Jeremy, you might want to just comment on the history here. So, obviously, myself and Robert weren't here at the time. So, Jeremy, give me a yes. <laughs> It knows you now. <laughs> it knows I'm here. Um, yeah, perhaps before I do, I might also just help the, the deputy with um, what the directive has to say about universal service, because I think it, the, the words are quite useful. It says, um, it says that... Um, in exceptional circumstances where, where these services can't be insured under normal commercial circumstances or cannot be insured under other potential public policy tools. So the, the test is whether they can, not whether or not the member state wants to use other public policy tools. Well, of course, then, in relation uh, to can, Mr Godfrey, I mean, it's, about, yeah. it's about cost at the end of the day. I mean, yeah. the state could put high-speed broadband, they could put a motorway yeah. to everybody's door yeah. if they so wished, so, but do they have the capacity yes. or the financial wherewithal yeah. to do it? And that's where we're yes. caught to some extent. So, um, so I think uh, I just want, want to be clear that, that that's the test that has to be passed. So that's uh, exactly, exactly that's how that test has been interpreted. That's as clear as mud, if you <laughs> with respect, you know. So. Well, you, and that's where transposition yeah, comes yeah, in. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so uh, just can, can yeah. come back to the deputy's question about the, the, the governance processes. Um, there are really, I think, in the, in the context of the state intervention, um, two um, significant um, pieces of governance. One is looking after the state's money, so making sure that, um, that the, the money is spent on the, public, on the, on the um, objectives which it's granted, making sure that the network is rolled out according to the rollout plans, making sure that uh, if the profits of the operator are greater than had been envisaged at the time the subsidy was calculated, that it can be clawed back and so forth. That, that's one set of governance that has to be done around looking after the kind of commercial and financial issues. That's actually not something which Comreg um, has, you know, does in any, in, any, uh, in any other circumstances. Um, then there's a set of governance requirements which you might say are related to the behaviour in the marketplace of the winning bidder. So what products do they offer? Um, what wholesale products do they offer? How is it priced? Are they um, treating all their retail service customers equally? Those are similar to the sorts of um, obligations that Comreg might impose on, uh, on an operator who's been found to have significant market power um, under our under our regulatory remit, but they're being imposed in this case on foot of the receipt, the receipt of state aid. They, they, they're not uh, under the guidelines um, limited to being, uh, being required as, uh, as a result of significant market power. Now, in terms of the latter set of obligations, those are ones where Comrade does have skills um, and experience and it is uh, envisaged in the governance process that Comreg would make available that skills and experience for the governance but the precise way in which that would be done and the uh, the precise role that we would have is a matter of, uh, again for the department um, you know in some ways the the supervision would need to be that both of those things would need to be done whatever model was followed um, and I think in the question of you asked do we have comments about um, about Air's um, assertion that they could do it for a billion. I would just say that as a regulator, um, the advice we provided to the government on this has been on matters related to kind of the, the, where there's market failure, what sorts of obligations should be imposed. Um, so under the state aid guidelines, those are the issues that uh, NRAs are expected to, to advise on. We haven't been an advisor on the potential cost to the public purse of different scenarios, um, and we haven't in fact had you know, been, been, had shared with us um, the information necessary to do that in any event. So I would, what I would say in terms of the money is it's, it's actually a matter really for the department to assess um, the plausibility of the assumptions that underlie AIR's um, assertion. It's for the department to assess whether there's a credible explanation of the differences between the assumptions they've made in the different scenarios, but it's not something that Comrade can comment on. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Joe O'Reilly. Thank you very much. And the few questions that I have to ask relate very much to your last answer to Deputy uh, Dooley. So they're uh, to a degree repetitive, but it's very important that we get this very clear and that I understand uh, what you're doing. So I suppose the first question then is, does Comreg regulation, does your regulation, 
go as far as state aid regulation? Do you, you know, do you deal with state aid? You... Do, do, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll answer that. No, the state aid is a matter, as you might imagine from the word, is for the state. Now, if there's a requirement for us to provide advice, then we can do that. But the, the, the formal process of state aid is for the member state, um, and in this case would be the for department. The so it's not it's, a comreg It's not. It's not a comreg yeah. Would comreg's regulatory toolkit and power to impose fines, you know, your, your, your carrot and stick, or really more your stick, would it suffice to oversee the national broadband plan? Have you the enough power that you could oversee it without the just that you could oversee it per per yeah. stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We, we, we actually don't in, in any circumstance. The answer is no. But, 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 but actually, you know, our our um, regulatory um, mandate extends to to companies who've been found to have significant market power not to companies who, who've, who've received so state effect aid. effectively the answer is no. The, the answer is no. The, the, no. the regulatory toolkit, as it, yeah, yeah, sorry. So, so I say, the regulatory toolkit, the functions we have at the moment, do not extend to uh, ensuring that companies in receipt of state aid abide by the conditions of that state aid. That's not one of our functions. And you don't have the toolkit to deal there? You don't have the fines and powers to get no, None of our functions and powers uh, relate to that uh, matter. Right. Why is there a difference between, and this is something that the reasonable bystander would be wondering about if they were in the room with us, why is there a difference between the type of regulation Comreg does over a company with a dominant market power uh, uh, compared to a company which is receiving public safety, a uh, public state aid, sorry, uh, from the state? Uh, why is there a difference there? Um, so there's an overlap. Um, in, th there's an overlap, I would yeah. say. Um, but as I mentioned to Deputy Dewey, um, in terms of state aid, there are matters which are nothing to do with significant market power, so looking after the money, making sure the network's rolled out, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of the behavioural um, aspects of the obligations, they are in many ways quite similar and the state aid guidelines encourage member states to align the behavioural obligations um, so, so that um, uh, to, to, to what might be imposed under significant market power, in particular the requirements to treat all retail service providers in a non-discriminatory manner. But the state aid guidelines do also say that it's um, perfectly reasonable and to be expected that potentially some additional obligations might be uh, required in exchange for state aid. So, for example, uh, under Comreg regulation of air, there's a set of products we require them to make available on a, on a wholesale basis, and the recommended products that should be required to be made available in the state aid context is a, is a somewhat bigger set of products. Um, so we don't think it's um, necessary or proportionate to actually require air to develop those products in the commercial area, but they are required um, in the in the other state. area. And so there's one other issue that I should say is the Comreg, um, or Comreg regulation under significant market power operates on a five-year cycle. So every five years we have to study the market and check whether or not someone has significant market power. We have to check whether or not that causes competition problems and what the appropriate remedies are. Whereas um, it's envisaged under, under the for a state-aided company, it's not unreasonable for the state to want to have obligations, the access obligations, to apply for the entire length of the contract. Yeah, so state aid is effectively for the department then. It's government. Is that the case? It's yeah, government. Yes, yes. There's, there's, no, um, there's no function for Comreg. Um, there's nothing under European law that requires a national regulatory authority to supervise um, state-aided companies by virtue of the fact that they have state aid. And then behaviour in the marketplace product operations are your brief? Uh, behaviour in the marketplace is a matter for us, um, particularly in regard to companies with significant market power, yeah. but it is quite possible that at least for some period a company that receives state aid need not necessarily have significant market power. And if they don't have significant market power, then they're only obliged to follow very general um, obligations that apply to all companies in the market. So I think you've explain the difference very clearly. Thank you very much. I'm finished, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Ryan.
But geez, apologies for being late. But I read your statement and, and uh, can I one, one question first of all? Um, is there a difficulty in state aids if it can be shown that the state is providing a state aid intervention which is more expensive than an alternative technological or business solution that could be applied? Are we not in risk of that if in this circumstance where we have an existing operator who has real experience in rolling out broadband in rural Ireland is able to say we can do it, pretty much provide the same level of service, close to it, slight variations, but it's significantly at a significantly lower cost than state aid intervention. Is that not surely called into question under state aid rules where you're, you're giving, in a sense, a better economic return in the state aid intervention than, is, than it could be assumed could be provided by an alternative operator? Is there not a difficulty? In, are we not running into that difficulty? So um, I think the question of state aid rules and how they apply is, is really a matter for the department. As I was saying earlier, Comreg is not a, a regulator of state aid. Um, I would also just reiterate what I said to Deputy Dooley in terms of the, the question of whether or not it can be done cheaper or not isn't something that Comreg is in a position to comment on. Okay. The, on the more general position then, is I presume the intention of our whole regulatory system, the whole European system, is in a sense is to avoid monopolistic uh, outcomes within technology deployment areas. Is that a fair assumption? Or? So I think um, the whole tenor of European e electronic communications law is to try to promote competition. Um, but of course it recognises that there are circumstances in which um, competition, say, in terms of network, at the network level, isn't practical or feasible. And, of course, where there's a market failure. So there are some areas where, where, um, where, where, where it's quite feasible to have two or maybe even more networks. There are some where it might be commercially viable to have one. But in the intervention area, there's a market failure where it's not even commercially viable to have one. Um, so, of course, um, the state aid would, would, is there to ensure there's, there is a network. Uh, and then to avoid monopolistic outcomes at the retail level, that has to be an open access network so that as many retailers as possible can compete. So it recognises that there may be as parts of the market where, um, where monopoly or market power is inevitable or, or, is, um, or, or is certainly present and may take time to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to disappear. And in the meantime, to make sure there are not monopolistic outcomes uh, for in the retail market. Is there any guidance within or any, I suppose, this is a political question in a way, but is there any indication within Europe where you have that outcome where it is a monopoly situation that there's a preference for state ownership of such a monopolistic network particularly versus a privatised? Uh, is, is Europe blind to that or, or, or is, that, is, is there any guidance as to whether private or public ownership of such monopoly assets is favoured? So uh, um, European law is entirely agnostic as to whether it's state-owned state, state owned or, or privately owned. Um, they, the, it looks at the market position of an operator and imposes obligations if the operator has significant market power. And, uh, and, and that's, that's the role of the independent national regulatory authority. The reason I'm asking these questions is, I mean, it, one of the outcomes of this approach we're taking, it, would you agree, in a sense, we are creating a monopoly in for rural Ireland, large chunks of the country, in network, future network ownership that, that will not be undone. It, it, once, you've, once you've signed this contract, that's the monopoly in place, and it will be in place for, for the foreseeable future. I know 25 years is a long time, but even beyond that, we're effectively creating a monopoly network provider here. So, and, and I know there's open access and so on, but, but, but the actual ownership and the the, the, the deployment of the, of the network or the use of the network, it's going to, we are creating a monopoly network here for rural Ireland. So it's very likely that um, there will only be one network serving many of the premises in, in rural Ireland. And say if it's not commercially viable to build one, it seem, seems less probable that you'll have uh, network competition. Um, I think um, in answer to a question that was posed to us by 
one of the bidders um, a few years ago about the interaction between regulation and the contract. Of course, um, a rural monopolist um, would still be subject to regulation, potentially. Um, if, so if, uh, if they were found to have significant market power, um, then they would, be, um, they, they would be potentially subject to regulation if, uh, if it turned out that the contractual obligations were no longer adequate to ensure open access. So there is that possibility. So, 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 so it, w it will be, um, a mon it, it, it may be a monopolist, but it will have access obligations under the contract and potentially, if necessary, supplemented under regulation later. But it, any such supplementary regulation or further regulation, even after the period of this contract, it's very unlikely a regulator would be able to apply stricter terms, as it were, than the terms that had been agreed in the original contract. We're not, the regulator would find a very difficult position to say, okay, now you've exited that contract, now we're going to really yeah. put the screws on. I think the regulator's job is to apply proportionate remedies based on the evidence that we find at the time. Do you have any sense, I know you can't look at the costs, but what, when AIR, in their discussions with us in this committee, they've made points, for example, and they're coming from real experience of delivering to rural houses, and what they argue is particularly, now there was uncertainty, they say the level of service terms are different, well obviously you've, you've a lower, higher connection charge in the, in the current air area, they, there's dispute over whether the next day repair percentage is what, what exactly, they've said that that's different to what the um, National Broadband Plan are, but more specifically and more particularly they're saying the provisions for providing connection into a house what they air seem to be saying is that they've learned from experience actually hanging it by wire is a very feasible, works well, technologically it's, it's been, may, may be easier than they thought it might have been when they started their process. And that the National Broadband Plan, um, rather than maybe following that example, is giving very lucrative terms for any developer to be able to uh, use ducting instead of overhead wires and, and to fund, is it up to 5,000 euros cost per house of the provision of such ducting. I, who was it said recently that the, 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 the reason they do this is so that we'll have a, the state will have a digger ready to go up um, every house and, and dig the ducting, but at a cost of 5,000 euros to the public, and, and that that air seemed to be indicating is not necessary. Do you have any view, as or does the regulator have any view, I suppose, on those key provisions in terms of the last mile connection as to whether we are stitching ourselves into a more expensive, very lucrative approach when air are saying as an existing provider of similar service to similar houses that actually can be done cheaper using overhead wire technology and, and that those terms are too generous. Yeah, I, th I think obviously the, the, the terms of the NBP contract are a matter for the government. It's not something that we have a view on. The question about any differences between what's in the contract and what air are proposing and whether or not that leads to, you know, what, what difference that makes for fi to the financials is also a matter for the government. It's not something we are able to comment on. And you don't have any regulatory role in the existing air provision of their services. Do you oversee or re review the quality of service that they're delivering? Is there anything in the 340,000 340, houses that should raise concern here that they've, that they've run into technical or other difficulties? So this is the way they provide um, their service in the 300k area is a matter for them, not a matter for us. It's not regulated. It's not regulated. Just one last question, if I can. Um, Mr. Brain, you were saying there that US you know, universal service obligations only ever really apply as the final piece in the jigsaw, the last resort. Mm. But again, going back in experience over time here, I mean, we for many years were debating, you come back now, debating the issues of universal service obligation for fixed line or, or the whole range of different services. I've never heard that argument before in the provision of universal services that it's only the very last. We, we've regularly discussed and gone to Europe and put in legislation in Europe around universal service obligation for. Um, I'm thinking of various different services, postal services, you can mix up all your different universal service obligations, but I've never heard that argument that, that it's only really the last resort, last resort. Yeah, I, I mean, just to be clear, I mean, what, what we're saying is that it's a safety net. So it doesn't mean that, I mean, that there is an appropriate uh, role for USO. In fact, it's very helpful for those people who are not getting services through, through the other mechanisms. Um, so, but that's inherent in any universal service. You know, that's the way the processes work. It's the same for postal. It's the same right across the piece. It's most of the people are getting a service. 
but some people aren't. And the purpose of the USO is to make sure that those who aren't benefit from, you know, from the thing that everyone else is getting. I mean, the exact level that the, that the USO would kick in, is it, we, we mentioned the 2% in the UK, is it 2%, is it 1%? I mean, those are matters at the time to go through and there'll be consultation or whatever else to ensure that whatever USO mechanism is appropriate. But that's the principle behind USOs generally. One, sorry, last, one last question. Just one the last question in terms of ownership and whether there's a concession or gap model. I mean, I, I've heard, we've heard various presentations here. You, everyone involved in the process usually says, if at this late stage you were to look to switch to a concession model where the state would end up owning the asset, you'd still maintain the other elements of the service. Everyone says, oh, that'll take a five-year delay, and oh, that three years, and... and um, Surely it is open for the state, or this I suppose, was an opinion as much as anything else, uh, even at this late stage in the process, to say, out of this process here, we've assessed the various options and a concession model is actually uh, a more appropriate approach to take. I, I don't see why that would necessarily lead to a five-year review of the whole process of starting off again. I mean, we've, in previous experiences or previous projects of universal service, or sorry, of... Um, broadband plans and so on which we've delivered in one or two years effectively why is it that our, have you any sort of timeline or any sense as to whether that switch to a concession model from your side brings any it may bring difficulties for the developer but from the state side is that still a feasible option do you think the um the question of how long it would take is really something that is that is matter for the department we're not we wouldn't be running the process um so we haven't got a, a view on how long it needs to take Senator Tim Lombard. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to thank um, the presentation we received this morning. Could I ask for clarification regarding your role regarding customer service and where you actually fit in as the regulator regarding customer service itself? Um, um, I think, could I first of all start regarding the AIR and the 300,000 that they're at the moment? Do you have a remit regarding customer service? Yeah. I'll take that. Um, yeah, in terms of the national legislation and where Comreg fits in, in terms of consumer service and rights, the universal service regulations apply across the board to all undertakings, including air, including mobile and so on. So our role is to uphold those rights and they, co they cover a range of things between contracts, um, switching, code of practice for complaint handling, I think specifically mm. rate, relates to customer service. So our role is very much across the board in terms of all undertakings, including air. So when it comes, let's say, to the USO, no, let's, when it comes to um, the phone and broadband, you do have a remit when it comes Absolutely, to... yeah. So in terms of the actual contract itself that with the customer, with mm. the end user, um, how that is upheld or not upheld, or the, from the retail perspective um, we're talking about, so how this, the service that has been contracted is delivered to the customer and whether it is in line with the contract is something we would intervene if the, if the rights were not upheld. So that role will, would remain. And regarding the, the USO, and when the USO would come in regarding, um, I think the presentation that you gave, if I could tie it up in three or four words, it's saying first of all you'd have the industry, then you'd have a policy, and after a policy then you'd come in and look at this kind of scenario. And the UK model was roughly 2%. That's basically in a nutshell. Okay, so for to move forward, so like regarding this kind of model we're looking at really remote areas that will be really affected in that kind of scenario so I, I, might, I might just so the application i mean obviously the nbp um, is designed to, to to cover everyone i think there may be a role for the uso as, a, as some sort of safety net it's not actually clear who would not have broadband after the NB, NB, nbp I suppose, I mean, this is a matter for future transposition. It could be looked at if there was a concern that there was some sort of safety net needed, then the USO would be available. But that's really a matter for the transposition and, and, and for the department. As and regarding in a scenario where you wanted to appeal or change the, current, the terms and conditions of the USO, does that come to E? Is it government? Where does that actually fit in? Sorry, if I can just clarify your question when you said something, I, I, if we want to change Well, the... not you. I'll give an example. There's, um, we have a year or so on fixed broadband, fixed... Uh, fixed line. Fixed line at the moment. Yes. 
Um, it's proposed that they're trying to get a change or a review to it at the moment. Yeah. What is the process pertaining uh, okay. to that? So um, it, it's a good example. We have a fixed line universal service um, uh, USO at the moment in place. That USO was put in place when, again, the original network was rolled out, it was ubiquitous, but there was danger that maybe some people wouldn't be still served or actually their service might be withdrawn. It's, if, if that USO was to be extended to cover other uh, provisions, it's, extended is probably the wrong word because it has to be revised. There is a process whereby you would analyse what is the new service you're looking at, what is the service, and you would look to see who's providing this in the market and so on. And I think, as, as Gareth has said early, earlier, uh, you would uh, have an open process to see um, if there are interested parties. No party can be excluded, and therefore it isn't a de facto that one provider or another would be a universal service provider. So you would have an open process if you established that there was a need for a USO. You would have an open process to see who is interested or who might be interested to provide that USO and you would kind of move on the process in that respect. And is it Comrade would run that process or the department? At the, at the current point in time, it is our, the process under the current legislation has been assigned to Comrade to run. In the future, we do not know because we have to wait till the de facto tra transposition. At the moment, in the directive, it talks very much about member states and whether Comreg has a role in that in the future, uh, we'll have to wait till the transposition has been completed. But with the fixed with the fixed line at the moment, is it you or the department? It is us at the moment in the current legislation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's good. Okay, I think that's it. And no more questions. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming before us this morning. Very much appreciate it. And um, our committee stands adjourned until the 16th of July at 2 p.m. Thank you.